the first two races are in the books, and we saw some great racing at the Volusia Half Mile Doubleheader. This is how you kick off the season. Today, we'll be talking with singles winner Dallas Daniels and the Super Twins rider who swept the Volusia Doubleheader, five-time Super Twins champ Jared Meese. This is the AFT Show, presented by Kicker Performance Audio. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the AFT Show. I'm Scotty Dibble, the voice of American Flat Track, the co-host of the podcast Off the Group. Beside me, this girl is old enough, but yet young enough to be my daughter. It's Kristen Beat. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm sorry that I said that to you yeah. off camera. That's so bad. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm Welcome doing well. Welcome to the AFT Show, Kristen. <laughs> how are you? But I was also going to ask you how with Amateur Nationals. I know you're up there. <laughs> I am good. So the racing up here has been really good. Amateur racing, you know, almost every day this week. We had some rain on Tuesday, but it's been just crazy. But uh, I just want to talk more about what happened down in Volusia. What a way to kick off the season. Oh. Uh, two great nights of racing. Yeah, two absolutely incredible nights of racing. And I don't think anyone uh, who watched the race or streamed the race on the uh, NBC Sports Gold app on Track Pass could argue this but the singles race i had goosebumps it was so good i don't think i've seen that compel a race that compelling in my entire career it was incredible you can always go back and re-watch that race like i have on demand and make sure to go to track pass for future live aft events i think i've watched that singles race three times right now so far and i want to watch it again because it to me it was the best race I've ever seen in my life. I, I relate it back to when I was a kid going to Springfield Mile when a big group of 10 bikes uh, we, you know, were all together. But this was AFT singles uh, just right there stacked together. And any one of those eight riders that broke away could have won that race. Mm -hmm. Volusia 2 did not disappoint, that's for sure. Absolutely. Friday night was good, too. Max Whale took the win. That was incredible. The first Australian to win an AFT singles event. And you know what? I've got a fun story about that. So Lee Diffie, he commentates for uh, NBC, Formula One, IndyCar. If you watch racing, you know who Lee Diffie is. I get this DM and he goes, hey, do you have Maxwell's phone number? And I'm like, well, I can get it for you. Uh, he's from Australia as well. So I feel like the whole country of Australia is now either buying the Track Pass app or uh, congratulating Maxwell if they already have it and saw the race. But it's definitely yeah. exciting for everyone from there to see their hometown boy represent. And Maxwell, I mean, his dad was in Australia at the time, um, taking care of some business. He's been training with the Bowmans. And when I asked Max, I was like, how are you doing? You could tell that he was just very emotional in that moment, getting that first win. But I think it would have been even more special if dad was there, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it would. But, you know, he's stuck down there with pandemic. But, you know, uh, Max has been getting faster all year long. He's been here a little while. He's used to our racetracks. I expect him to win some more races. Also, on Saturday, the FT Singles winner was Dallas Daniels. We're going to have him on the show a little bit later on. Let's yeah. briefly touch on the production twins because we're going to talk to those two riders next week. Two different winners. Uh, mm -hmm. Ryan Varnes won the first night and Corey Texter uh, somehow rebounded. Uh, he was struggling a little bit, even though he got on the podium the first night. Mm -hmm. He comes off with the win on Saturday night. Yeah, and on Saturday night, you could tell it was just his style of track. It was a little more road race. He was hooked up. The groove was a little bit wider. Uh, the first night, it fell into some people's wheelhouses. It just didn't fall into Corey's. And so there's only so much you can do within your realm of where you're comfortable, right? But Saturday night, man, that was like Corey Texter's meat and potatoes. And you're really close to Corey, and you kind of know um, how much they've been working on the bike and the decisions they made um, with that bike on Saturday as well. Well, yeah. And on Friday night, he told me he started on one bike, rode the next bike the next time out the next. He switched bikes like four different times. Well, to me, it's hard to get focused on one and you don't know if you're changing something for the good or the bad. So it's hard instead of just making one little change to a bike, you're switching to a different motorcycle. So I think that might have been a little bit of the problem. Of course, we're going to talk to him next week. We'll kind of find out. But the big show, you know, the all new Super Twins presented by Vance and Hines, uh, you know, they debuted down there in Volusia and it was dominated both nights by Jared Meese with a little a bit of controversy there on Friday night by the Indian motorcycles as well. I mean, oh my gosh, the first night I think it was one through six was uh Indian the Indian motorcycles, and then top finishing non Indian motorcycle seventh was Dalton Gautier, and that says a lot too. Um, I, I was really excited, I kept my eye the entire race on Dalton Gautier making his debut in the Super Twins class, of course, the 2019 AFT singles champion. 
And uh, being able to kind of watch that race progress and being able to keep an eye on those guys who are on new bikes or with new teams was definitely exciting. Sammy Halbert, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I know you're very close to Sammy as well, and you guys spoke. And uh, what do you think of Sammy on the um, Indian motorcycle back by Kenny Coolbeth? I think it's a good fit. I think it's going to take, you know, maybe a couple more races and we'll see him on top of the box possibly. I mean, Jared, it looked like he was on a league of his own after the little incident Friday night with Carver. Carver had something for him for a little while. Uh, on Saturday night, uh, you know, Sammy was fast. Sammy's fast both both nights. But, you know, he's getting more and more comfortable on that Indian. Uh, I've heard he's got one that he's practicing on and spending a lot more time on it. So I expect him to be further up front. And you mentioned the Indian dominance on Friday night. Indian dominated on Saturday night, the top nine spots. Yeah. And uh, something that I thought was really interesting about Sammy Halbert that he told me that I never kind of thought about. He said that this year being with Kenny Kulwith, Kenny, of course, the former champion, that their conversation, their communication in the pits is just so much better. And I didn't really understand how, you know, it, it could be any different than working with a mechanic. But he said, because Kenny Kubik used to ride, he understands when you need to continue to make adjustments and you're just not comfortable with the bike. And so he doesn't feel like he's asking a favor of anyone. Like, hey, can you do this for me? Or, hey, can you change right. it a little bit? Kenny Kubik, like, gets it. Like, he has a firm understanding of what that, what you need to be comfortable with to get on the track. And that has helped Sammy incrementally. And it's so cool to kind of see his program develop. And, and, you know, Kenny has rode those exact motorcycles. You know, he just got off of them two years ago. Last year, PJ Jacobs had rode for him. You know, so just a couple of years ago, Kenny was on that exact motorcycle. Yeah. So he knows what kind of changes and what those changes will do. Yeah. And I mean, even speaking to Jeffrey Carver and Jared Mises incident, um, I like to call it an exchange. Uh, during that exchange, you and I both watched it. We spoke about it after we saw it. All, every angle that was captured that night. And I'm kind of curious what your take was on it. And I know we're going to hot take from Jared Meason a little bit here. Uh, you know, I think it was a racing incident. Was it aggressive? Mm, maybe. After looking at the different views, would I have done it? Possibly so. You know, what you think about is in, in, in a racer mentality, if that door opens up, if there's a, an, an, an opening that's six inches, you take a foot. So you mm -hmm. stick that front wheel in there. Yes, they did touch. Yes, um, maybe he would go back and do things differently, but maybe not. Um, Brad Baker said that he would have done it, but maybe not so early in the race. I don't know if, if that's the case. I mean, you have to be in the spot, in the moment, and it's a split second decision. You know, uh, yeah, you have, you, you're looking at it going into that corner, but you got to make a decision. Are you going to do it? Are you not? And it has to happen like that. Yeah. 100%, but it definitely made for some exciting racing in the early opening stages of that race. Um, I think it set a precedence, so to speak, for the rest of the season. And I don't think so much about the aggressive racing or you know anything like that, but I think there's a sense of urgency this season. Like everyone is racing like as if they have to get it done and they have to get it done now. And uh, Ingvar Rauman even told me, I had conference calls with all the riders before the season started. And he said, you know, my mentality is the same it was in 2019, which is win at any cost. And some may call it reckless, but it's also what kind of propelled Briar towards that uh, 2019 championship. That idea that you're able to take risks and even if it means sacrificing one position, you're taking risks to move forward. And I think that is the mentality, of, uh, I mean, amongst the paddock this year, because you have to on double, double, double header weekends, double, double weekends. Um, you, the points are too valuable. And, and you spoke about Briar just a little bit. He wasn't his normal self. He had, you know, some some reasons away from the track that he wasn't his normal self, but yet he still salvaged two second place finishes. It, it looked like he still has the speed. Maybe the drive wasn't quite there. Uh, maybe he can put some of that stuff behind him. And uh, you know, we'll see him up front this this entire year, I promise you. Well, and I think, too, that says a lot. If his 90%, so say, for example, he's only giving 90%. If his 90%, is second place or uh, second overall on the night where will he be at when he gives a hundred percent so right. that's kind of a right. that's a compelling that's a compelling thought there thinking maybe throughout this season if he when he gets back to 100 percent, what we can expect of briar bellman yep, absolutely there's great racing but with such dominance this week's aft on the aft show we talked to the five-time champ the five-time super twins champ jared meese let's bring him in and welcome to the show jared meese how you doing man I'm doing well. How about you guys? We, we're great. Congratulations on win number 49 and 50. What a way to kick off the 2020 season. Congrats yeah, on turning 50. What's that? <laughs> Congrats on turning 50. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a heck of a way to uh, 
to pick up where we left off last year and um, to open up the season with two wins like that. I mean, that's what we trained so hard for for the last 300 days or something like that. So uh, it, it was a good way and, um, you know, built some momentum really quick and early and uh, obviously very happy with the result. So, Jared, did you even know? I think when Ricky Rackman told you that that was win number 50, I, I, I saw a surprised look on your face. Like, you don't count how many wins you have? I mean, you looked really shocked. Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I, I don't count count, but I mean, I knew that I had 48. And then, of course, I had 49. I just just dawned on me then when he said, hey, you just hit win number 50. It was just like, oh, wow, that's that's awesome. You know, I mean, I knew I had 49 wins the night before, but it hit me. You know, it wasn't like I went across the line. and was like, yes, win number 50. You know, it was like when he said it, it kind of just hit me. So very cool. Um, you know, I never thought growing up in, in my career that I would get 50 wins. I mean, obviously, we wanted you know, you want a hundred, but, uh, you know, 50 is a tall order. So, um, I'm very, uh, very happy to get that achievement and look forward to getting some more for sure. In 2019, you had said something about being a little bit behind the eight ball to start the season. Um, now this year being able to kick off the season with that momentum. I mean, speak to the value of momentum in this sphere in this series, especially with doubleheader weekends. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, every rider is a little bit different. I mean, momentum is 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 good for all riders. There's no doubt, but I seem to thrive off of it very very well. And uh, yeah, last year I was put behind the eight ball uh, right off the bat, and man, every time I seemed like I would get kind of in a little bit of a a gap there, or, or at least in striking distance, it would you know something would happen to myself, and something would actually happen to Briar. We were kind of like yo-yoing for a while, and I really you know. The other than the miles, really, the other, the only other racetrack that comes to mind that we actually had a pretty good battle in was like uh, Texas of last year. So, because I mean, I had a problem, he had a problem, and then you know, in the miles, everybody kind of battled with one another because it's drafting game. So, uh, yeah, I mean, to start off this year with two wins is a heck of a lot better than what I started off uh, the season with last year, and um, you know, it feels good to start. You know, in 2017 and 18, I started with some wins. And uh, the end result was great. So I'm uh, hoping that we can keep the momentum and um, keep carrying and clicking off these wins. That's for sure. Jared, Jared, I think you and Robbie Pearson probably have the most laps at Volusia Speedway, even though it was our first ever Grand National there. Um, did that help you going in? And how many changes did you, did you have to make to the bike? It seemed like you were dialed in from the moment you touched the track. Yes and no. Um, the track was a little bit different. I would say the first night on Friday night, the track was more similar to how uh, Robbie and I would race it during like a Steve Nace all-star race or something like that. Um, more right around the bottom, one line. But the next day, they uh, took the Honda Talon out there, and um, which, is, which is a side-by-side, -side, obviously, and uh, like rode away above higher above the line that we rode the night before. And like kind of like marked off a groove for us and all of us went right out there right away and attacked the groove and made it fast in practice on saturday the track was almost scary fast like it was almost like go out there and do something to slow us down because it is on the edge you know um so they did a great job the night the next night with the track and getting us able to move around a little bit um setup was actually a little bit different than what i ran there in previous just some gearing changes were different and there was a little bit more traction you know when we race there in march of course the the temperatures are cooler and things like that and of course it was very hot down there this year in uh, or this time in july so um i think that could have played a little bit of effect and they also used calcium chloride um which steve nace i don't think does use much calcium chloride at all it's mostly water but uh regardless it was um it never hurts to make laps around that track, you know, for, for knowing that you're going to have a national. I mean, I never would have thought in a million years we'd have a grand national at Barberville Volusia, you know, a place where I've raced on when I was on 80s. So um, you just never know what's going to happen in the sport for sure. Jared, do you think that your ability to kind of be able to, to be a leader in this series, that other riders maybe look to you, um, and follow suit with the tone that you set while you race. I've noticed that a little bit. I'm just curious if you noticed that. Uh, you mean like a monkey see, monkey do type thing? No, I mean like, think about like New England Patriots, like a captain on a team or like a, a hockey team captain. I know that 
in each sport, like it, it's very individualistic when it comes to motorsports. But I see like a, a captain role developing for you, and then I also see sometimes the precedence that you set in the racing. Other riders may be mimicking that or following after that. Yeah, I guess I don't take that close a notice really mm -hmm. with uh, with that. I mean, it seems like. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are always wondering what we're doing to our bike and they always are checking that out. But in return, I always check everybody else's bike out too when we're up at the starting <laughs> line and, or, you know, staging area or whatever, just, you know, you just wonder what they got. I mean, everybody's mainly on an Indian uh, motorcycle right now with the exception of what, uh, five riders. So, you know, I think everybody's, and, and, and they're all the same chassis even, except for, I think one out there has got a custom chassis. So, you know, like even back in the old XR 750 guys, guys had C and J frames and J and M frames and, you know, they had a lot of different things. So it wasn't as, you know, you'd look at something and you wouldn't know, you know, if what the frame they had, or you could see what frame they had, you'd be one, one different, but the FTR, a lot of those bikes out there are so, so similar. I mean, they're, they're almost identical in a way. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people check out what we're doing or wondering what we're doing all the time, but I don't really see, you know, I don't really pay attention to people like mimicking what I do, but maybe, maybe they do. I just don't, I don't, you know, when I get to the races, you guys know me, I'm like <laughs> tractor beam sucker right in, you know what I mean? Just focus. Yeah. So it's, uh, right. well, it's, uh, there's, there is a change around the fence. Like in the, um, when you guys are on track, the singles riders, Aiden Reese Evans, for example, I spoke with him. And I asked him what he's watching when he was watching the Super Twins. And he didn't say the riders. I wasn't, he did say the lines to Jared Meese. And that seems to be something that replicates itself throughout the pits is these singles riders follow you. Like if Jared Meese is doing that, that's right. That's the right way to do it. And I was curious if you've taken notice of that. No, that's awesome to know. But I haven't taken much notice. Um, there was a, a kid that came up to me and and um, during the, the, the night, uh, the uh, the um, Ott, James Ott, is it James yeah. Ott? Yep. And um, nice kid, man. I think a kid's got a lot of potential. And yeah. he was just like, uh, hey, got a question about setup and some starts and things like that. So he said it helped. So, I mean, I, yeah, hopefully I shot him the right way. It's sometimes, you know, it's sometimes you're like, you, you, you wonder when you give somebody advice if you screwed them up more or you, or you helped them <laughs> out, you know what I mean? So uh, he said it helped. So that was good. Right on. Well, Jared, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the incident with you and Carver. Um, did you get any slack about it? Um, Brad Baker said he would have done the same thing, maybe not so early in the race. I mean, walk us through what happened between you and Jeffrey on Friday night. What was that? You guys broke up. I couldn't hear you. I would say. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, here we go. Here, here's the joke. Okay, here's, here's, here's the jokes of Jared Mead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I, I I heard the same thing a little bit over the loudspeaker with Brad with, uh, you know, might not have done it that early. I mean, a couple questions with that is like, you know, what's the difference if you do it on lap two or you you, you did that on lap 33? You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's it's we're racing and I had a really extremely good runoff turn four and drove it underneath of him. And I had a lot of time when I was beside the guy to where he knew I was there. And uh, I'd have done the same thing as Jeffrey probably and fought for it. It's just one of those things where you're fighting for such a small piece of real estate and I wanted it and so did he and it was racing and uh, that was it. I mean, you know, there's there's some guys in the pit area, you know, like that I respect everybody in the pit area, don't get me wrong, but there's some guys in the pit area that I, it's like right on, dude, you know what I mean? Like you got, you got that extra little bit and, and I would always say like Jeffrey was one of them, man. Like he's such a cool dude and like that race we did it last year at Lima, like we didn't touch one time at that place and we passed each other, you know, 30 times or something like that. And we had some awesome battles there and Black Hills one year we had a sick battle. So, I mean, you race that tight and that close, you know, so many times throughout your career, you're, you're bound to have a little bit of a, an elbow or rub or something like that. But definitely not the way that I wanted to see it go down. But at the end of the day, if the, if a, if the opportunity was there, the exact same way again, I wouldn't have changed anything I did. When I watched it and I rewatched it like three, four times over, I felt the urgency in it. So like when I saw it, it reminded me of something you had actually told me on a conference call this off season where like this season, you don't have time. Like you have to make things happen like now. 
Um, do you feel like that maybe sets a precedence though moving forward um, as for what you could maybe expect on the flip side? Because I mean, maybe this is just a question for you as a writer. Do you have like a mental notepad of like how people race you in exchange for how they might, how you might race them? No, I mean, like, you know, obviously if we would line back up at a race and Jeffrey would have go into the, into the corner and T-bone me or somebody would T-bone me and blatantly knock me down, then that's a whole separate incident. But if we go in there and we're racing each other and mm -hmm. I'm on the outside and he runs up the inside and I try to race for it and I go down, it's, it's racing. Like I said, that, that move was a racing incident and it wasn't a clean out. It wasn't a takeout. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if, if there's, if he wants to try to do like a redemption thing or they're talking about redemption or something like that, then I mean, you know, I guess yeah. we'll see what happens, but I don't think Jeffrey's that kind of dude at all. And I mean, I think he was upset of the situation and, you know, like kind of want to apologize to the team. I didn't, I didn't apologize for what I did. I just apologized for the situation that them guys are working extremely hard. They've been going to a lot of races. Um, they've been putting in the time and effort and it shows uh, he was going really good that day, but um, I'm not sorry of the move that I did. I'm just sorry of the situation of the outcome because I really don't think my move was was anything wrong. I, I think it was racing. Sorry, we're that? both talking. Kristen, go ahead. Do you stop your alligators? Let's change the subject. <laughs> oh yeah, I still got them. <laughs> Have uh, you shown them to your daughter yet? Has Hayden seen them? Yeah, she loved them, and uh, my dog hates them. I should send you the video. I put them down. My dog barks and, barks and hair stands up on his back. Oh yeah, but no, Hayden. Hayden loves them. That's the alligator. Oh no, she called it a dinosaur at first, which she's nice. Kind of That's right. Yeah. yeah, that's a dinosaur. <laughs> That's cool. Hey, what'd you think about getting that kicker speaker? You know, up there on the podium. Looks like you got two of them already. I mean, it's pretty cool that uh, a, you know an extra thing up there on the victory podium and the kicker speaker it's it's dust proof it's waterproof you can hear it 360 degrees around man it's a, it's a really cool speaker yeah i got like 75 bucks a piece for him i'm <laughs> 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 oh, sorry man. we need to cut that i said something i shouldn't have said <laughs> no no they uh no they're cool they're, them things are awesome those uh bluetooth uh speakers i mean it's not even worth having a radio, a real radio anymore. You know, and things kick ass. So, um, I'm pretty pumped on them. I got two of them. So I got one for the Michigan place and one for the Florida place. I think my mechanic was thinking, Oh man, you got two. Yeah, like, yeah. You got yeah. two, like you got two. We're going to give them one. <laughs> if Kenny always pulls the, you don't want that. Yeah. Leave that in the truck. Yeah. Leave that in the truck. He says. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to tell you guys a story. So for everyone listening at home, <laughs> On a Friday, and mind you, like, I'm still learning this. I come from Navi, like, motocrossy kind of stuff, so I don't exactly wrap my head around all this stuff. But I asked Jared what tire he was going to go with this past weekend, and the choice was the five or the nine. And I'm sitting there with my notebook writing everything down, and he goes, yeah, the 7.5, the, the 7.5 seven five, the seven five is definitely the way to go. you, you got to go with the 7.5. So I write it down, and I'm walking over, and everyone's asking me questions. And I ask uh, Ricky Howerton. And I go, hey, so what do you think about the seven five? He's like, Kristen, there is no seven five. And I'm like, <laughs> that one right there, that one. <laughs> All you guys see is this straight face. This guy has nothing but laughs in the pit. He's always giving people a hard time. Yeah, yeah, that seven five worked good. <laughs> worked real good. Yeah, yeah. really good there. I got. I've got one more question. Uh, what do you think about the timed races? I mean, 36 and 37 laps or 37, 38 laps, whatever it was, man, that's a long time. It was pretty mentally draining more than it was physically fitness, really like the clock sitting there. And it's like, <laughs> it's like when you're in like detention or, or something in school or like a class you hated where you just keep looking at the clock, <laughs> look at the clock, look at the clock. Is it time yet? Is it time yet? You know, and we were doing 20 second lap time. So you, you know, let's just say it was on the high seven minute side, you know, you do two laps and it still was saying seven something, you know, I was like, damn, you know, come that on. Stuck. Um, I, I mean, I think I'll like it, especially if I was in like a big heated battle where we were breaking each other down. I think it would be a lot of fun, but being that, you know, being in the lead early both days and, and leading it, it was just like, come on. And to be honest, like, uh, speaking to a few people that are big fans of the sport and, and, uh, friends that have been watching forever. They're like, man, it just, you know, like the singles race could have went 
25 minutes because it was such a cool race where the the twins won just i, I guess it, you know after everybody kind of settled in and started spacing and gapping one another i guess it just um i, I don't know i've heard the word that it got a little boring so so well yeah, I don't it know must be that. Tape or, or what but uh as far as rider goes like i said i think i think it could be pretty good especially if battles went on for a while but uh is what it was yeah i, I don't know, know how to make it more interesting hard to be that good just oh. to be that good when you're just clicking off laps it must be tough yeah it's, it's like, like there was there was a spot in the main event i swear to you i started thinking about coming home and having to weed whack <laughs> I swear. Wow. I was like, whoa. Like, well, I literally well, thought about starting focus. my weed whacker. Yeah. <laughs> focus. Yeah. I, was like, I, I, got guess, weed I guess we, we, we can make it more interesting, Jared, if you just want to start on the back row. I mean, yeah. it's up to you. Oh, I don't got time for that. Well, I mean, you, you did. You uh, had a lot of yeah, for stopping. <laughs> well, it was just a glimpse. You know, it wasn't like I, I thought about weed whacking for like three laps. I just went in the corner. I was coming down the straightaway. And for some reason, I remember thinking about my weed whacker. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> and the oh, girls and all the like, your to do list, your honey do list. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, Jared, weed whacker and, and uh, had to get it done. Jared, get back out there. Take care of your weeds. Thanks for stopping by. All right, guys. Have a good one. Yeah, thanks. Let's get a word from our sponsors. We'll be right back to the AFT show. It's been a long road since the original kicker christened that first pickup truck. It kicked off a car audio renaissance and upgrading your music in a vehicle was a requirement. America's music machines became living loud over your passion, your emotion, your existence. Outdoors or on the open road, your sound is kicker. Welcome back to the AFT Show. We saw our first ever doubleheader weekend in the AFT singles class. Dallas Daniels struggled the first night, didn't even make the main event. But on night two, he went on to win his second AFT singles career win. Let's go ahead and bring on Dallas Daniels. Hey, let's welcome him in. It's Dallas Daniels, winner of night number two down in Volusia. Dallas Daniels, again, welcome to the show. Tell us what happened on night number one. Well, day one, I mean, uh, yeah, we obviously struggled really bad for uh, whatever reason. But, um, you know, it was just coming off the off season. I think we had a lot of success racing uh, local races like Traveler Re Traveler's Rest and Terre Haute, Indiana, and some other stuff I did. You know, we pretty much won everything we went to, whether I was by myself or with my team. So I think we came in with maybe a too much confidence and me telling myself all winter that I want to win this championship. And I think I just put way too much pressure on myself. You know, uh, I had not any good, not, not a good qualifying session at all on Friday. And immediately that put me back, but it was still second row. So with four guys being on a row now, it wasn't terrible, but it still wasn't good. So, I mean, I got off to a good start and I was in probably sixth or seventh. And then uh, I tried to make a dumb pass around the outside on a one line groove. And we all know how that works out. And I think it's just because I had in my head that I needed to be up front. When I wasn't up front, I think I just, my brain went dead and I, uh, I just kind of freaked out a little bit. So I kind of tried to work my way back up and I made the same mistake again and blew off the groove. And, you know, by that time, an eight lap semi, the race was over. So, I mean, my day was done. And when I came back, it was like me and my dad, it was, it was just disbelief, you know, because last year I made every main event I entered and I finished respectfully and most of them, unless I fell down or broke. And it was just, it was really disappointing because I've come into this year knowing I can win a championship, knowing I have the team and the motorcycle and the crew. And then to not make the first main event of the year, like everybody's looking at me like, are you serious? And it was just, I mean, it was a headache for sure all night. I, I didn't eat dinner. I just went straight to bed and I just wanted to forget about it. <laughs> but, you know, you, you still have won two, two wins in seven races, um, 11 career AFT single starts. I mean, you've done incredibly well at this point, though. You're 11 points <clears throat> outside of the point leader in singles class next year. And to, to close the gap, Obviously, you know, this is the plan. This is what you have to do. 
I mean, what are you, what, what did you start kind of mentally telling yourself after that first night? And how did you reset between Volusia one and Volusia two? Well, uh, a lot of it was my, uh, writer coach and kind of sort of my trainer, Johnny Lewis at mm -hmm. Moto Anatomy. He was, he was making me basically keep my head on straight all night because I was kind of just like, like I, I wasn't like mad. I wasn't upset. I was just like lost and I didn't know, you know, being in that situation is kind of the it's first time I've ever been in that in my professional career, obviously. And like, as soon as I came in, I sat down in the chair and like JD was the first person that came up to me and he was like, he was like, dude, don't let it get to your head. We all have bad days and coming from him, you know, I mean, he's had probably every bad day you could imagine and every good day, you know? So it was like, everybody's telling you, no, no, don't worry about it. Forget it. We'll get it tomorrow. It's like, you know, 20 people in my pick could tell me that even Tim, Tim was like, don't worry yes. about it. We'll get it. I'm in, I'm here with you. But, um, I still just, it didn't matter who told me what I was still had it in my head that like, I don't know how that happened or how I let it happen. So pretty much I just had to take it upon myself to leave and, you know, go to sleep, wake up and just be refreshed and, you know, put it out of my head is, and that's what I did. And Saturday was obviously a way better day. That was a great performance by the whole Estenson team there on Saturday night. Your, your teammate, Mikey Rush, got to share the podium uh, with you. What was that like having Mikey up there, you know, kind of a mentor to you? Yeah, obviously it was really cool sharing the podium with Mikey. I mean, it took me and my teammate Ryan Wells last year all the way to the late race before the last one at Minnesota. So to do it this quick, it was uh, it was awesome. I mean, um, he had a really good day both days, finishing fourth and then obviously third. And uh, he's he's an expert, so it doesn't matter if he qualifies 16th or fast, fastest, he's going to be there in the main event. And that's kind of what I've learned from him a little bit. But, um, I mean, yeah, we were pretty much 1-2 the whole race until the red flag came out. I think we probably would have finished 1-2. And after watching the video, I think he might have been sleeping on the line or something. But uh, Or else we probably would have definitely been 1-2. But still, to share the podium, I think this year will be 1-2 eventually because we have such a great team and great bikes but you know one three at the second round isn't too bad i don't think you know i spoke with johnny lewis right after the semis on day two on saturday and he told me that they threw you a curveball they had completely changed the bike from top to bottom like right before that semi for you to go out and work your way and i mean they gambled like they took a gamble were you aware that they were going to go that far with the bike as um as far as they did and Tell me about how the bike kind of evolved throughout the day. People forget that this is still the first race this season. You guys are still kind of shaking the bike down in race trim. You're talking about Friday or Saturday? Saturday. Yeah, so Saturday they made a um, – I wouldn't call it like a drastic change, but it was definitely something that was like if the track was this way, it's going to be great. But if the track goes the opposite way, it would have – it might have been a little bit more tough to ride. But uh, we were we, – me and my – Crew chief James Hart were uh, paying attention to the track and Johnny Lewis also. And we knew that before the main event, it wasn't going to go the way that if we made the change, it was going to be bad. So we, we paid attention to everything and, you know, we were very on top of it. So no, I wasn't, I knew that my team and Johnny and my crew chief James and my dad, that they, they had it all under control. And I don't really question anything those guys do because James is one championships on his own and race wins with other riders as my dad and you know johnny has obviously done his fair share of racing and winning his national at daytona so never once have i questioned the change them guys have made they obviously know way more than i do and i put all my trust in them dallas i see the trophies right there uh have you named the trophy and i saw that he had his mask on his face <laughs> No, uh, I haven't. I haven't named him, but I thought I might put a mask on before he gets in trouble, like the rest of us. So I don't know. I need to come up with that. Maybe Kristen can help me. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome, Dallas. Um, all the winners this season get to take home a kicker audio bullfrog, and those are the coolest. I have one out in my garage. I one on the boat. Like they're fantastic. Um, have you gotten to try yours out yet? Well, to be honest, when they brought it up on the podium, I thought it was just a prop for a picture. I didn't realize we get to keep it. And then yeah. that, that just that just gives me more of the drive to win because I want to stack some of them speakers up, you know, get the, the place bumping wherever I am. Get the place so, bumping. Uh, I love it. That's awesome. 
Um, but you were telling me that you're actually staying down in Daytona a little bit longer as your sister's birthday. You have a little sister, and uh, you guys have been able just to kind of relax and hang out. I think people sometimes forget, Scotty, and you can kind of attest to this as well. You're only 17, so like it's important for you to kind of soak up those memories and the destinations we go to. Um, you've been to Daytona a lot, maybe not this trip, because I know that you guys are kind of limited with COVID, but what's your favorite part about heading down to Daytona and kind of racing in that area? Uh, hanging out in Daytona is just, it's been probably my favorite place to come and race and go on vacation ever, just because it's the racing capital of the country, you know? I mean, you walk down the beach and they've got the 200 monument and all that stuff, and there's, you know, like today, me and my dad and my buddy Kyler and his brother and his dad, we went and saw the NASCAR museum for the first time and they've got Ricky Carmichael's 250, Chris Carr's Knox bike. Like, you know, obviously we're not car racers, but it's still really cool to go look at all that history and what's happened here in Daytona. And I mean, it's literally the reason I like it is because it's just racing. Everything's mm -hmm. racing. You know, they got restaurants that are racing, you know, I mean, everybody pretty much knows about racing because Daytona 500 is one of the biggest NASCAR races in the in their series you know so i mean i like coming here vacationing just because you know i'm a racer and that i like being around racing stuff yeah dallas um so. do you th do you think you still have a shot at the championship even though you missed the first night's main event Good question. well after friday i was kind of stressing out about that just because when you look at the schedule it looks like there's not a lot of races but you got to remember that there's double headers you know, we don't travel as much, but there are, you know, still a lot of races to run. So I was, uh, yeah, I was stressing a little bit. But after after Saturday, you know, I'm six then points, only 11 points out of the lead. So I think 100% I have a chance at this championship better, even the same shot as I would if I won both the first round and the second round. You know, uh, these, these guys are really tough. And I think there's probably going to be multiple winners every weekend which I think is what makes the class so exciting. So, uh, yeah, I still think I have a great shot at the championship this year for sure. I got a follow-up to that, Dallas. Um, what race are you now focused on the most? Well, this this year I'm with uh, being double headers, I'm trying to just keep my head focused race by race um, just because, you know, you really need to put all your focus into the next round because it's, you know, double the weekend, double – put on your body, everything that you know, you're going to be maxed out quicker than you would be on a normal race day. So I just, whenever the next race is, I focus on that and I, you know, try to visualize the race and watch videos of the racetrack if I haven't been to it and, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. Like the new Dallas half mile, I've already started watching car videos on that because I've never been there. I don't even think Scotty, maybe Scotty's been there, but I know my yeah. dad hasn't and uh, neither is my crew chief, James Hart. So we don't have any notes. But it's still good to look at the track and see what we're going to. Uh, Dallas, when you talk about the doubleheader weekend, something we we're all I think really curious about was how your guys' body would adjust and how you would feel after the the doubleheaders. How did you feel? How were you able to kind of hydrate? And what did you learn from this first weekend of uh, doubleheader racing? Well, luckily for me, I have, like I said before, Johnny Lewis at Moto Anatomy with his wife Alicia that are very nice enough to let me come down and stay at their property and ride to get used to the heat. So I had been down in uh, Florida for about two weeks before the first race because I knew it was going to be really hot. And, uh, you know, we planned that way back before the season was going to start because we knew that being in Florida in July was not going to be as fun as everybody thinks. <laughs> so, but then days leading up to the race, it's just hydrating yourself because it's you sweat so much during the race day and everything's boom, boom, boom that you get dehydrated so quick. So it's just you know, keeping fluids in me and trying to eat as much as I can, but not eat too much and eat the right things. But really, it's just pounding water. I mean, you know, it's hard to drink too much water. So you got to keep up on that. And I don't think it'll be as crucial as the next race is unless it's really hot, which I think it might be at some of them. But still, your body, everybody, and especially this weekend, because we practice Thursday. So everybody's body by by Saturday was pretty much toast. I think everybody went and just passed out. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dallas, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Take care of that trophy and enjoy your vacation. And congratulations on your second AFT singles win. Congrats, Dallas. Thanks, guys. 
Kristen, what a great show. We got to catch up with the five-time champ, Jared Meese, and hear his thoughts on uh, you know two exciting victories, number 49 and 50 of his career. And then we got to talk to Dallas Daniels, uh, you know, missing the main event the first night. We got to hear why and what his thoughts are, and then winning night number two, one of the most exciting races I've ever seen in my life. It was so exciting. And being able to kind of get these guys away from the track and have them just sort of peel back the layers and, and be real with us, it was nice. I, I thought it was funny when when we asked Jared about the little incident with Jeffrey Carver. He acted like he didn't hear what we said. I, I know he I know he heard us. Hey, oh, he heard us loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Don't forget to tune into the AFT show next week. We'll talk to both AFT production twins winners. That is uh, Ryan Varnes and Corey Texter, and I can't wait to hear from them. And we might have a surprise guest for you. Yeah, very exciting. Also, remember, you can go to Track Pass on NBC Sports Gold for live AFT coverage all season long and on demand for last week's race at Volusia Half Mile. Uh, just tune in. And, you know, it's like $12 a year. You can't beat that. You've got to check it out. And even if you wanted to, to watch it on NBC Sports next week, you guys can do that Thursday after the uh, Kansas Speedway NASCAR race. But also, if you want to rewatch the Volusia Half Mile, you guys can tune into NBC Sports Gold, the Track Pass app, and just rewatch that race right now, too. Either way. Well, I'm already ready for the next race, but until then, we'll see you next Thursday, Kristen. Thanks for, uh, thanks for everything you do for us, and uh, have a great week. It's been a long road since the original kicker christened that first pickup truck. It kicked off a car audio renaissance, and upgrading your music in a vehicle was a requirement. America's music machines became living loud over your passion, your emotion, your existence. Outdoors or on the open road, your sound is kicker. Head to victory lane! Yeah! Over 130 miles per hour, I love it. 